Folkies, Emily Balkan here. Several of you have asked me the same question, which is pretty much how to play well for dancing, how to be a good dance musician. So in this video I'm gonna try to answer to this question by giving you some tips and also explain a bit how playing for dancing is different from playing for a listening audience and like a few things you should pay attention to when you want to play for dancing. So the first thing that is important to realize is that playing for a listening audience, like a concert, is very different from playing for dancing because of the difference of attention that the listeners are giving to you. Basically, listeners who are sitting down and fully listening to you are giving you almost 100% of their attention, their focus. Whereas dancers have to put focus on their steps, their own dancing, maybe their partner if it's a couple dance, where they are in the room and that they are not people bumping into them or that they are not bumping into people and your music comes somewhere in this mix but it's not as prominent as people who are just there to listen to you basically when you're playing for dancing you are more like creating a canvas to allow your listeners basically your dancers to paint their own picture on so you can influence which kind of stuff they're gonna paint with the canvas but it's still their art. You are more like a support for their creation. You are a parameter of their creation. Whereas when you are on stage playing a concert for people who listen to you, you are the creation. Your music is the creation. This is quite an important point to understand because it means that you need different abilities for playing for one or the other situation. And it also means that it depends a lot on your training and what you are used to, what you have developed as abilities, basically. A musician who is extremely good at playing for concerts, really nice to listen to, beautiful tone, ornaments, great arrangements, full of emotions, might not be as good for playing for dancing, and vice versa as well. Because it's a question of different things that are important, basically. And now we're gonna go through what is important when you play for dancing. Number one, tempo. Your tempo should be right for the dancers and this depends on the dance you are actually playing, the kind of music, the kind of dance. Some dances are fast, some are slow. You should neither play too fast nor too slowly. And of course you have a bit of freedom for like each type of dance because there is not like one very definite tempo for each type but you should not deviate too much from like the average usual tempo that people play it. And also you should have a steady tempo, which means you're not going to slow down while you're playing or accelerate or like stretch your beats and so on. In Scandinavian music there are a few couple of like definite repertoires and types of dances where we actually have elastic tempo and some kind of stretching out the structures a little bit, the rhythms. But this is kind of an exception. I would say most of the time it's really good to be steady and then if you want when you're experienced you can stretch a little bit. How to know which kind of tempo you should play at? Well, if you're a dancer yourself you can check how it feels for you, what feels as, as a good tempo for you for dancing and if you're not a dancer you can listen to good dance musicians and try to find like a general tempo, you can ask them maybe and you can also play for some friends and ask their feedback like was this too fast, was this too slow and everything. And how to keep your tempo steady? Well, let me introduce the favorite and most hated instrument of torture of musicians, which is the metronome. Obviously, when you know which tempo you should play at, you should practice it with a metronome, because that's the best way to not accelerate nor slow down and to keep a very steady tempo and beats. Uh, yeah, we all hate to play with metronome, I'm not different and I'm also a teacher who tells my student to play with metronome and they don't do it because they hate it and I don't do it myself because I hate it too. But you should definitely practice with metronome. Do what I say, not what I do. Then there is another trick you can also use to have a steadier tempo. It is to use the bounce in your body. So basically, you have probably seen lots of Scandinavian players who 
are bouncing a lot when they play. Like we do a lot of this kind of down up, down up when we play. Polska, for example, uh, vals, a bit like quicker. We all have different types of swing in the co in the body. Like we move in different ways, but it's very often that you see Scandinavian musicians going up and down a lot when they play. And this is a good way to keep your, your tempo kind of steady because your body is quite a, a big thing to move around, so it has momentum. So once you have started a certain rhythmical pattern with it, it will follow it quite naturally. Depends on the people, depends if you're used to dancing and moving your body or not at all. But if you are a little bit, it can help you a lot. Don't trust your feet too much because your feet are a very versatile part of your body. They're like your hands, almost. They are small and very easy to change the speed of them. Like it's very easy to stomp quicker or slower. It's fully okay to stomp when you play music. And if you train to stomp very steadily and to stay steady no matter what you play, you can learn to stomp very steady and it can be a help. But in general, it's less reliable than a bounce in your body because your whole core is moving. And as said, your body has more momentum. So try to settle down in the movement in your body and you can trust it more or less, at least more than your feet in principle. So you can just learn to like bounce while listening to music and feel this like pattern in your body. You move the way you want, there's no police for this kind of little uh, bear dancing that we do while we play. But find something that works for you and that don't doesn't require like a huge amount of concentration. Something that feels quite natural, that you would naturally do while you listen to music. Doesn't matter what it is. And then you take your instrument and you start to play something easy, like an easy tune or something, and you increase the difficulty. And beware to not adapt the movement of your bodies to your music, but actually adapt the tempo of music to the movement of your body. I know it's easier said than done, but that's the idea. The second point that is super important when you play for dancing, I already touched it a little bit, it's the rhythm and the bounce. Those two things are very close together, so I'm putting them together. Um, because the rhythm you play defines the bounce of your music. I say bounce, this is an approximate translation of the word svikt that we use in Swedish and Norwegian. And svikt means how much you go up and down and also which kind of wave you're doing with your, with your body weight in a way. Different types of tunes have different waves. And this is very nerdy stuff and it's quite hard to explain, but it's not that hard to feel. It's just very hard to explain. But for example, if I play um, the Stare Slengpolska straight... It feels a lot like a Slengpolska. It's really like... The bounce is really regular because the rhythm is regular. But if I dot the rhythm... Suddenly the rhythm is changing and the, um, the bouncing is also changing. It gets more bouncy. So that's why I put those two together. And this is one of the key parts of being a good dance musician, but it's, as said, one of the hardest ones to explain. Basically, it lies a lot in the technique that you're using on your instrument. So it depends on your instrument. For bowed instruments, it's a lot about bowing patterns. That's why I talk about them all the time, and not only me, but lots of teachers as well. For different instruments, for example, for singing, it can be breathing for wind instruments as well. I can't exactly define, I, I'm not playing those instruments, <clears throat> but defining like the bounce and where you put the energy up and down and this kind of stuff is really what makes a good dance musician. So you can also check a lot like the technique of good dance musicians, the ones that are recognized for being good dance musicians, and look what they are doing and try to copy. As usual, it's a lot of imitation. The third point that is super duper important for being a good dance musician is the structure. Basically, different types of tunes and dances have different length of structures and the shorter the length, the easier it is not to mess it up and when it's a long length of structure, long structure, then it's harder like to keep it straight and to not mess it up. So, Halling and Slengpolska have a one beat structure, so if you add one beat or if you remove one, there is no big problem, you just go on, no one will probably not notice. 
Um, polska and vals have a three beat, so one bar uh, structure. So if you play a four beat bar in the middle of your polska or your vals, it might be really weird for dancers, but it's quite easy to get back to it for you because the structure is short. Then you have shotis and menuets that are like more two bars, and then you have much longer structures like hambo, and that's really like you should keep a big close attention to your structures and to not mess them out because then it's really complicated and dancers can be really like confused if suddenly there is one bar missing or one beat missing and everything is shifted from a little bit of time. So it's very important to keep a close eye on your structure and always know where you are in the structure of the dance. And as said it depends on the dance you're playing if you are good at counting music and or if you are a jazz player from the start, you have this pretty easy, I guess. If you're like me, you're a classical trained person and you're very bad at counting in general, it's gonna be harder for you, I know how it feels, but try to stick to the structure as good as you can. And then when those three points are met, when you are steady in your tempo, you have structures that are really good, and you have a nice bounce that is very dancey for your dancers, then you can take care of all the rest. And all the rest is playing in tune, playing the right notes, playing nice tone, um, playing nice ornaments, making nice variations and arrangements. All this musical part, like the musicality, the real musicality, that is so important for concerts, comes only after the three main points that I talked about when you're playing for dancing. So, of course it's nice if you also have the musicality and the details and everything when you play for dancers, but it's not necessary, at least not as necessary as the three first ones. You can play out of tune, but if you're, you're steady and you have the rhythm and the bounce and everything, it's nice to dance to you. Whereas if you have beautiful tone and intonation is perfect and you have nice ornaments, but you're completely elastic in their tempo and the dancers can can't feel the beat at all, it's not really nice to dance to you. Then there is an, one more point that is also very important, but it's less about your own technique. It's picking the right tunes. They are a majority of dance tunes in the Scandinavian repertoires, but not all of them are good dance tunes. There are many tunes that are irregular, weird in their rhythms, following unusual patterns, or that have been composed to troll dancers. There are some people who write such tunes. Maybe I do sometimes. But these tunes are hard to dance to, especially if your dancers are not extremely experienced. So if you know that you have dancers that are not super experienced or beginners even, especially for a dance workshop, choose very steady tunes. Like in their rhythm, they should be really steady. If there is a little changing pattern, like one bar that is a little bit different, usually it's fine. Um, for example, this tune. There is one bar in the middle there that is a short first beat polska, where the rest of the tune is a triplet polska. I don't even know if you noticed it. That's a short first beat in the middle of the triplets, but it doesn't disturb if it's just one bar. But when it's many bars, or if it's like, for example, the Solomon Huggins Good Not Lot that I taught in a video a few months ago, which has an A part that is in triplets and a B part that is short first beat, that's really confusing because it's a full switch of like rhythmical pattern in the middle of the tune. And if your dancers are not experienced and can't handle this, they are really gonna be confused. So don't choose this kind of tunes, don't choose the trollish tunes which have weird rhythms or irregular structures. Um, do this only if you know you have good dancers and you know you can troll them a little bit, they will manage, but not to beginners or people who you don't know really well. And also try to not pick tunes that have very long breaks and or very long notes, because those are the easiest ones to like rush or slow down or lose the beats. I've mentioned already dance workshops, that's also a little chapter I would like to talk about. Playing for dance evenings is a bit in between concert and dance workshop, 
because your musicality is still important, people are still listening to you, probably not everyone is dancing, there are always a few people sitting and listening, but if you play for a dance workshop, all I've said about the three main points to pay attention to is reinforced like 100%. Because when you play for a dance workshop, the dancers are really not paying attention to actually what you play. They are really needing your canvas of music to be super solid so they can learn to paint. So if you play for a dance workshop, you have to be extremely steady in the rhythm and tempo and structure and give them as much bouncy, dancey pulse as you can. And what is a good news for people who are not extremely experienced is that for a dance workshop you don't need to play many tunes, nor complicated tunes. You can play very simple tunes and like two tunes for an hour of workshop or something, maybe three. It's good to have a bit of variation, but you can stick pretty much with the same tunes and you're gonna get bored, but your dancers are not because they're not really listening to what you're doing. They are trying to learn something with their feet and bodies and partners. So they are really not paying attention. They will hear that it's the same tune, but after a while they will not even hear the tune at all. They're just gonna hear the pulse in a way, the beat. And here let me give you the example of Christopher uh, Suha Petteson, who is a very good um, nickel harpa player. And he plays for dance workshops. And he's amazing. He's extremely steady. He's extremely bouncy. He has a very energetic play. And he plays the same very simple boring major tune for like two hours with not one variation. And at first I was quite surprised when I, I heard him play for a workshop because it's super boring. I don't know how he doesn't get bored. But for dancers it's great because after a while they don't hear the music and he has this very groovy playing and it's really nice to dance to. So you can even go full uh, Christopher style and just play one very simple tune with no variation so your dancers just have something very straight. Also in case you make some mistakes when you play for a workshop, this is also valid uh, for dance evening but even more for a workshop, don't drop the beat and don't drop the structure. It's fully okay to play mistakes. They might notice but maybe not even play nothing or play a few random notes somewhere and if you like me you can even like do a ah! <laughs> I tend to do that when I, I play wrong at a workshop or rehearsal when it's not like on stage or performing uh, just to let out my own frustration at myself and usually it creates like a funny bond with the dancers because they hear like oh there was a mistake there and they hear my shout much more than the actual mistake but it's funny it's a funny noise it creates a nice funny bond in a way. Uh, you don't need to do like me, it's better actually if you don't maybe, but I just wanted to tell you because it shows that you don't have to stress out about making mistakes in the melodies and the notes and the chords. This is totally not important. Keep the beat, keep the structure going and the dancers will be happy because you didn't let them down on those very important points. Last part of this video, how to start playing for dancing if you're not used to it yet. Well, I would say start very informal, like hang out with friends who like to dance and maybe they want to dance a polska in the kitchen at 2 in the o'clock in the morning and they ask you to play some music for them. That's a perfect occasion. Like, you just take your nickel harp or flute or whatever and you play one polska and you ask them, like, is it good? Is it a good tempo? And if they are good friends, they should answer and maybe give you some advice or something, ask for advice. Um, don't be afraid of critics, it's always a bit hard to get critics, but it's a good way to improve if you're not experienced yet. And then you can start playing for more and more formal dance events. And my other tip to you is to not play solo for dancing in the start, but to play with someone who has experience in playing for dancing. Like you have a friend or someone you're used to play with at jam sessions or something, and there's a possibility of playing for dancing, like the end of a dance evening or something, and you write your name, you decide that you're gonna play like two tunes, start little, two, maybe three tunes that you know well, that you feel comfortable about, and you ask this person who is nice and who knows how to play for dancing and he's a bit more steady and less emotional than you are, and you play with this person. So you have someone who is acting as a safety net for you and who is actually keeping the beat and the tempo and the structure and you can just get yourself leaning on this person and get on there, on this safety net, 
and play for dancing and then you will get used to keep this structure and to your own emotions when you play and everything. It's basically playing for an audience except that they're not really listening and they're kind of loud because they're stepping everywhere. So that's it for this video people. This was a lot of talking, not much playing. I tried to include a little bit of playing but I hope I gave you a lot of technical stuff anyways. I also hope it was a good inspiration to start playing for dancing if you aren't doing that yet. It's one of my favorite parts of folk music, playing for dancing. So I hope we are gonna be many and uh, you are gonna enjoy it. If you have more questions about this or suggestions for new videos, please write to me about this in the comments. And if you like this content, this kind of videos, think about liking and subscribing, sharing with your nerdy friends and supporting me on Patreon. That's the best way to see those videos going on. All the links are in the description below. Also, if you have questions about Nicole Harpaz or want addresses of builders, that's also on my website, also in the description. That's all for today, folks. I hope you will have a lot of fun. Play for dancing. Dance if you're also a dancer. And I will see you next time. Hey, doll!